Hi, I'm Ben. And I'm Carl. And you're listening to Secret Sonics. Honest conversations chock full of tactical advice to help you build your dream career in music and audio. Whether it's skill development, mixing mindsets, personal branding, or work-life balance, we talk about ways to help set yourself up for success in the ever-changing music industry. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome back to Secret Sonics. (laughs) You're doing it wrong. I know, I know. That was on purpose, though. It's going to be, hi, Ben. Hi, Carl. (laughs) I got to shake you out of your old ways. Wow. Uh, How you doing, Carl? How's it going? I'm good. It has been very cold here. We were talking about this before we hit record. We got some snow, not a crazy amount of snow here in Pennsylvania, but enough snow and cold enough temperatures that we had a snow day yesterday. So my daughter was home and going stir crazy all day and had a two hour delay this morning. So my whole week is all garbled up, but. Oh man, semi bummer, I guess. But maybe you guys got to play in the snow a little bit, like snowmen, anything like that? We we did. Snow people? It was just, honestly, it was just a little bit too cold because it was like this morning, it was 15 degrees out, like Fahrenheit. Wow. What I, what I think is like negative 10 Celsius. That sounds about right. Yeah, it was it was too gross. And I think, yeah, it would have been a little rough for, for the kiddo to be out there. She would have loved it. She would have had a great time, but she definitely would have had all of her fingers and toes fall off. <laughs> she hates wearing coats. She's at that age where she like hates putting coats on. She, she wanted to wear Crocs to school this morning and i'm like it's 15 (laughs) degrees out you're not wearing crocs and no socks you crazy person that's yeah that's when you lay down the law when i when i was growing up we'd go skiing in like vermont or like massachusetts and it would be like i remember we'd always go like in january and it would be like i don't know sometimes like minus 30 fahrenheit like it would be like insane and like my fingers would fall off basically without falling off the the equivalent of almost falling off or whatever that is would that have made you a better bass player like, would you have, like, if you lost one of your fingers when you're, yeah. like, you're, you're a righty, right? I'm a right hand. Yeah, I'm right handed. So if you would have lost, hypothetically, here, bear, bear with me. If you lost one of your fingers on your left hand, I imagine at first that would have been uh, an obstacle, but I feel like it would make you train the other fingers even better and you would be somehow become some kind of like crazy. Yeah. Was it Wes Montgomery who had that? There's another guitarist. There's like a famous guitarist. Yeah. Oh, Django, Django. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, you know, yeah. James Jamerson, you know, the famous bass player from Motown, even though he had all of his digits, like, he's famous for his, like, hook. Like, he would only use his pointer finger to play bass. And I was actually listening to an interesting interview with Michael League from Snarky Puppy. I don't know if you're into that stuff, but I, I super like Snarky Puppy. And he was saying, like, it's just like a totally different feel if you play with one finger versus two. It's like almost like if a drummer, if you're doing, like, two hands playing the hi-hat versus one hand, like that R&B thing, it's like it's like the difference between disco and R&B, right? It's like a to- completely different feel, groove. So like in terms of like the right hand technique, I think there's even more to be said about that potentially. Anyways, we digress. <laughs> anyway, sorry. I'm sorry about the hypotheticals. No, it's so good. We got a, a little bit of uh, pre-episode banter going, I guess. This is, this is how it works when you have a co-host. <laughs> well, today the topic is accepting criticism from your peers, people you're working with, whoever it might be. I think they're all everybody hits a point in their music career where they're kind of like are, are served and your ego gets completely uh, squashed by people telling you you didn't do this well or you need to improve this or, you know, something like that. So I guess the question is like, or the topic is, how do you accept that when maybe mindsets that you can shift towards to uh, better receive criticism and not let it completely deflate your ego? That's the topic. <laughs> what do you think? I have a lot of thoughts. I have a lot of thoughts about everything, I guess. But uh, about this specifically, I think maybe I have a lot of thoughts about it because I have a lot of practice. Yes. When I say being criticized, that has a bit of a negative connotation that I don't think we're we are talking about, right? We are talking about hopefully getting constructive criticism or at least doing things and setting expectations and asking for criticism in a way that sets you up to receive constructive criticism. Right? Yeah. Being specific about what you're getting thoughts about and 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 the reason behind it. My, my first thought really is more of an example and something that I see all the time, and I'm sure anybody listening has seen this endless times, either on Facebook music groups or on Reddit or somewhere like that. But somebody will post their song, like an unfinished demo or a finished demo or a finished recording or whatever, and they'll just post a link to it and say, hey, here's a song I'm working on. Let me know what you think. And unsurprisingly, 
people will either just say, that's cool, and have it be a completely meaningless <laughs> response. response. Yeah. Or they'll point out a whole bunch of rip things. Them, they rip them to pieces, on. rip them to shreds. Yeah. But, but none of it is beneficial. And the reason that I say that it's not beneficial is even if the person giving the criticism is well-intended and educated and like giving thoughtful things that he he or she thinks will make it better, if they don't know the context of what the goal of that song is or what stage it's in and why that person is looking for a response and, and for feedback, then their response is irrelevant. You know, even well-intended constructive criticism is irrelevant if it's given without understanding the deeper context of why the person is asking for the criticism in the first place. Yeah. It seems like also just like a crazy move to kind of just like throw your work up there for people to just scrutinize without any context, without any like, you know, it's like, what, <laughs> why would you do that? Like, I, I mean, not to be too harsh on this person, but probably better to choose wisely who you want to share it with. Hopefully I mean, maybe they don't have a circle of people that they trust to to share this with, which might be another issue and something to think about. But like building a building a little cohort of friends, uh, peers that can help you like listen to your music would be a better way to go about doing that. I think than just putting things up there on a on a big Facebook group. You know, I agree fully, and I think what I've seen is that the people that do that are generally pretty green, right? Yes. They're pretty pretty new to it, and I think what it is is they haven't had enough experiences getting burned by people criticism. yeah you know i think that's it i think they just haven't had that experience yet so they don't understand the value of building that team or that that circle of people that you trust i, I don't know how, how connected this is to the original topic but something i'd i look at as an extension of the topic of receiving criticism it's how to figure out who your circle should be like how do you form that circle of trusted people to get criticism from because i feel like that's a, a huge a huge part of getting meaningful feedback is meaningfully asking yeah. for the feedback and whether yeah. that's how you say it how you phrase it or who you ask in the first place who's yeah. your circle like do, do you have a circle like what's like who's your circle who's my circle yeah i think my circle i'll t I'll tell you i mean at this point i really rely on my mastering engineer to kind of give me mixed feedback because i feel like that's kind of the the point where I lose my objectivity and thankfully my mastering engineer is there to kind of, you know, say, Oh no, you, it's great. Or yeah, maybe you could do this with the kick drum a little bit or, or whatever it is. And that kind of gives me that kind of like, Oh, takes me out of like, you know, the trees and back to the forest sort of moment. So for me, that's a big part of it. And also, you know, friends, I have like cohorts here also in Jerusalem that I'll share music with. And uh, through the podcast, I've met some wonderful people that I'm in touch with and will randomly share stuff with and they'll share stuff with me. And I also have people that ask me for questions and send me, send me music. And it's usually people that are either peers or a little bit below a couple rungs below me in this, in this journey of music and audio. And I'm always happy to give feedback when I can, you know, cause I love it when people give me the feedback and I love giving people feedback. And it's kind of this symbiotic passing down the, you know, passing the baton on sort of thing, which helps everybody, you know, get better as we go along in this journey. So yeah. I definitely have uh, people that I send music to. So my question then, I guess, to follow up with that, you don't have to necessarily like name the specific people, but what are the characteristics in a confidant that you look for? Like, what are the things about the people that you trust to get feedback from? Like, what are those, what characteristics do they have that makes you say, oh, I trust this person's, this person's feedback. I trust their opinion. And I also trust the way that they give feedback. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm thinking specifically about my mastering engineer now because I just got a track back from him today and shout out to Connor. Yeah. I just like, I, I know he's listened to more music than I, than I have, or he's listening to more music on a daily basis than me because he's a mastering engineer and I'm working on one song while he's doing like 10, you know, and he's just objective. He doesn't, he's not invested in, you know, the project until that moment. He's kind of coming at it with totally fresh ears. And with that experience of listening to lots of music. So that really helps me get confidence. And the other thing, yeah, is just like people that I, you know, I know they're not going to like rip into me as like on a personal level. I know it's just like going to give me constructive feedback only in a way to, you know, want me to be, do better and, and help me. And with, they, they still have my back. It's not like a troll on the internet who's going to just like, you know, try to dismantle my whole sense of uh, confidence in this endeavor. 
yeah. I, so pe- people, I guess that I know they have their, their my back. I know I could rely on them for actual real f- feedback, constructive feedback, and also like that's coming from a place of goodwill and not you know malice, <laughs> so to speak. How about you, Carl? Uh, well, I'd have to say I'd to say that my mastering engineer gives me really great feedback is, you know, not me being very novel here, you know, because yeah. I'm just, I'm not trying not to steal your answer, but it's a good you know, answer. I, yeah. <laughs> friend of the show, Nicholas DeLorenzo. You know, he's actually the person that put us in touch. I think he's our connector. Yeah. And I think he is. And we, and Carl, we met, my, my wife wanted me to bring this up that we actually met through the podcast. It's crazy that like you're the co-host and like we only met because of this podcast and Nick is actually the person that put us in touch. So shout out to Nick. Yeah, you, you think that after all this time, you would have realized that I'm just full of shit and that you, should, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't talk to me or listen to me. And now you've you've uh, invited me into your home like a vampire. Yeah, exactly. But, exactly. Uh, yeah, so, you know, having, I, I guess I have different people that I ask for different types of feedback from. So yeah, like Nicholas, like I'll ask him for the, you know, pre-mastering mix feedback and it's usually very specific and very technical right like it's like you know do a high pass at 26 hertz with a 60 b shelf on the kick drum like those those kind of notes wow which is great and super helpful but also there are people that i try to just get you know either mix notes about or just general like, you know, this style more than I do, like what sticks out as weird, yeah. you know, like what, what, what feels authentic and what doesn't feel authentic. And then I have to ask myself to like, okay, if something doesn't feel authentic to that style, is that an artistic choice or is that something that I need to fix and do better? Nice. Right? Is that, a, is that a quirk about the artist and the song where they're trying to tie in other genre influences or is it something that I just missed the mark on. I also sometimes, I haven't done this as much recently, but for a long time, especially when I was kind of getting started, I would also ask people that I knew didn't know anything about production of music Mm. because I would just want them to give me their thoughts as a listener. Like, was anything distracting? Like, did anything stick out to them? Because if something sticks out to someone that doesn't know production, you know, there's, there's an issue. So that there is value in that too. I know yeah. my wife, I love her dearly, but she used to just get so frustrated and I'm like, not frustrated. She'd get annoyed with me for always wanting her to listen to songs that I worked on because I, you know, I'm into high energy electronic pop, you know, and pop adjacent stuff. If she could just listen to nothing but Bob Dylan and the band. <laughs> I love it. And nothing after like 1978. My guess was going to be James Taylor based on how you set that up, but. In the ballpark, uh, I guess. Not as not as much, but I but yeah, but if, if we so yeah, musically, like she doesn't naturally enjoy the kind of music that I make anyway, mm-hmm. which is fine. And it's that's that's great. Um, but because of that, it's you know, she doesn't know anything about production and also doesn't really know anything about the styles either. So as yeah. a listener, she you know super doesn't, uh, super like yeah, ob- objective because she doesn't have any, you know. Yeah, she she has no doesn't have the opinion. knowledge, insight. Uh, you know, predisposed uh, disposition to like or dislike something based on something. <laughs> I'm not making any sense. I'm sort of rambling, but no, 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 I think no, no. you understand what I'm saying. Totally, totally. Hey, everyone. Friend of the podcast and Grammy-nominated engineer slash mixer, Travis Ferentz hosts Progressions, Success in the Music Industry. It's a podcast exploring creativity, productivity, and growth in music. Travis has set out to document his own journey and bring those valuable lessons to you to apply to your own career. Join in each week for conversations with some of the industry's best and brightest about the mindsets and strategies that they use in their careers every day. Whether you're feeling stuck, digging for inspiration, or just looking for a mix tip, Progressions is probably for you. Go check it out wherever you get your podcasts or click the link in the show notes. Yeah, so I mean, like over the years, I've sent stuff to, you know, I think I've sent some stuff to like Matt Huber just to like get get thoughts, uh, Andrew Mari. Um, people that I've always, you know, looked up to and, and 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 have met that I really trust their trust their ears, you know. And now having uh, having management, like being able to send David stuff to listen to, has been really great. Especially when it's more of like the pop punk sort of leaning stuff, because that's what he's you know really into as a as a listener. Yeah. So so depending on the style that I'm working on, depending on the artist, I might have different people that I'll 
ship it off to you and ask their thoughts. But yeah. either way, it's the, the same kind of characteristics like you were saying, where it's a person that I know is going to listen and listen with care and is aware of why I'm asking them in the first place. Yeah, that's great. Which comes down to me being selective about who I send it to, but also me being selective about how I present it and not just say, hey, here's a song. Can you tell me what you think? It's like, hey, this this mix is like 99% there. I feel like something might be off, but I can't tell what. And I think I've just heard it too many times. Is there anything that's like jumping out at you as objectively weird? Or are there any things that, that are like subjectively weird that you feel might may or may not be working? You know, but like giving that or saying, hey, this is like not mixed yet. This is an early production, but I just feel like the bridge is unnecessary. Do you think this is potential or do you think that I'm I should right. just make yeah. it short and sweet? You know, yeah, yeah. I think the the more practice you get at asking for specific criticism and, and providing context and the more experience you get at getting unhelpful criticism i think the the combination of those two things i think is what's going to really help to train you to be able to not just get feedback more constructively and be able to take it better but also like you were saying giving the feedback and giving the criticism yeah in a much more constructive way yeah it's making me think of a, i had an experience over the summer i was mixing a record and I had i have a friend whose parents live in my neighborhood and he was like visiting and he came just to hang out i was like oh check out this mix i'm working on and he's like, oh, that's cool. That's cool. And then like once the vocal started, he's like, I'm out. I was like, well, what was what was it? We were basically struggling to get this this song to work. And it was like a New Orleans kind of uh, kind of a vibe. And the issue was that like he was singing the verse like way too low and just by himself. And him kind of like expressing to me in the room was so helpful because it's like I knew that something was wrong, but I couldn't like articulate why it was wrong. And that that kind of led me spiraling and figuring out, no, this needs a gang vocal. And we ended up getting a gang vocal and it completely changed the song and made it awesome from like the chorus always sounded good because it was like high higher in his register and it was working, but like but yeah, but it was uh it was a cool track. It was kind of like a Jewish New Orleans uh what's the name of that uh the genre? Is it offensive to say Jew Orleans? Jew Orleans. Hey man, I got I got Jew Orleans roots. This is my my, gr my grandfather was born in New Orleans. So Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Jewish Creoles, baby, or can hey. I say that? Is that is that allowed? Uh, well, I guess we're, we're not we're not we're not Creoles. We're Jews. I apologize if I offended anybody. It would have been my fault anyway. I started it. <laughs> um, do, you, do you have any memories of times that you were given, I guess, like well intended but completely unhelpful feedback, like not just like a straight up like troll response, like this is garbage. Your voice is terrible. Like not something like that, but something that where. They were thoughtful, but completely missed the mark as far as what the artist was going for. Well, I could give you, I've, I've told the story on the podcast before, but I made a record in 2013 and I sent the files to the mastering engineer here in, here in Israel to, to master them. And he kind of said like, listen, like, again, I was newer in the job, you know, like I wasn't, I didn't have the years of experience that I have now. And I was also very afraid of what this person was going to say about my mixes and my productions and stuff. And he said, oh, it sounds great, but like the, the kick and the bass could be done better. Why don't you send me the kick and the bass? This is a whole other conversation, stems, right? As stems, separate, and then the rest of the mix by itself. And then I'll make it all happen in the mastering process. And I was like, okay, you're the mastering engineer, sure. And I sent them, I sent him all the stuff. And then what he sent me back was just completely not what I wanted. And, you know, in retrospect, he made it punchier and stuff like that, but that's not the vibe I was going for. I was going for a big, I was going for like warm and kind of tubby low end, not, not sort of punchy, clicky low, you know, kicks kind of stuff. And he just, he was trying to be helpful and he made a great point about my mixing, which was not up to par, but nevertheless, it was now a record that I didn't want and that I didn't intend to make because he had asked for that kind of the, the, the stems of the bass and the kick separate from the rest of the mix. And like, I already knew at that time, like, oh, they're all going into the same bus compressor, or, you know, maybe this will change things or whatever. But I I wasn't aware that it would just change like the entire tone of the record to that extent. And I was like super disappointed. And we ended up just using my mixes. I went back, I sat with him, we mastered it. He's like, it's a little, it's boomy. I'm like, but this is my record and this is how I want it to sound. You know what I mean? And I had to go with my, my internal comp compass there. 
And uh, that was a really big learning moment for me on so many levels because I bought Bob Katz's mastering book. I learned all about it. <laughs> I obsessed. But the, the, the criticism was probably good, but it's not what I needed to hear then. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and it wasn't, it, it wasn't within the context of what the artist wanted and what you wanted. Yes. Well, I was the artist, yeah. <laughs> oh, it was like your solo. It was actually like, yeah, a solo record of mine. Yeah, yeah. So Don't it, listen to it. I think the songs are good, but the... the <laughs> The songs are the songs hold up. I think. But don't listen to it. Yeah. But don't. They, uh, no, hold listen. Up, hold up. I'm proud of it. It was a, it was a, it was an important time of my, of my life. But uh, but yeah, don't listen to it. A semi. I'm semi proud of it. If you want, check it out, and I'll I'll accept your criticism because I I have 11 years after that in my belt under my belt. So bring what may. Okay. Okay. So that actually it was an unintended little uh, pivot. My question then is, how late in the process is criticism beneficial? Because I know, obviously, you know, you were not saying, yeah, give me the criticism on, you know, this song that came out 11 years ago because you were going to actually do anything with it, right? It's, it's too late to do anything with it. Yes. So you have a, like a threshold or a landmark in the process that you feel is too late for any meaningful criticism. Yeah, because it's, it's done, you know, it's shipped. But now if I'm working on something and I trust the person who's giving me criticism, then I'll definitely hear something out so that I can maybe get a better product. And uh, that's different than like a record I released 11 years ago. And now someone just like, you know, rips me a new one because of a, a song that I made when I had less skills, you know? <laughs> well, I, I could say that because I'd, I'd say for me, you know, once the song is, is done, or at least like once it's been uploaded for distribution, for sure, then yeah, I know it's not going to be doing too much good unless the feedback is specifically related to what I could do better next, next time. time. Yeah. If there was something that I could learn from it. But again, that comes down to how do I ask for that? Who do I ask for that that feedback from? Do you, and how do I explain to them that, hey, this is done, this is going to be released, you know, in in six weeks, whatever. But if there are things that you think I could do better, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Some of them, maybe I could have done better. Some of the things may have been an artistic choice that, you know, the, the artist wanted the bass mm -hmm. to be as loud as it is, even though I didn't agree with it. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I made my argument, but they... You know, it's their song and they, they kind yes. of can beat it with that. Of course. You know, so if, you know, when they tell me that the bass was too loud, I could be like, thank you. I'm not crazy. You know, but at the same time, like that wouldn't affect <laughs> my choices in the future. Right. And so, so do you, who, who do you ask? Do you have anybody that you ask for feedback from after a song is done? Yeah. So at that point, I think I'm asking friends, like my bandmates, you know, people that like I trust their taste just to kind of say like, hey, did we do a good job on this? You know? And I usually can tell before I show it to them if they're going to like it or not based on how well I know their, you know, their tastes or whatever. And maybe that's like even a good indicator. It's like drawing your, I was thinking about this as we were talking, like having like your friend avatar, like listening over your shoulder while you're recording or mixing or something. Be like, you know, would my buddy like Dan think this is cool? You know, like, he probably would. Let's let's keep going, you know? Or like, ah, this is lame. Let's 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 start over. You know, that could be like a cool idea to think about while you're working on a song. But yeah, like I, I kind of can al already tell before I, sh I show these friends what they're going to think about it. You know, I'll I'll show it to them knowing they're going to like it, you know, or or the other way around. If I if I know they're not going to like it, I probably wouldn't show them because it wouldn't be very helpful or meaningful. But just to like give me like a, a boost of confidence almost to be like, you're doing good work. Like, keep at it. <laughs> How about you? Well, I was going to say, I want to follow up on that and ask you then how much of an influence, like if you were to take, you know, if you, if you were to ask yourself, I wonder what Dan thinks of this, would Dan like this? How do we balance what we think is right versus what we think the artist wants versus what we think, you know, the end listener wants? I know that's, that's kind of a big rhetorical question, but you did bring up that that idea of like, you know, having these other people's opinions in mind when making decisions. And I'm curious. I would say tastes. Yeah. How does that, how much does that influence your taste and how much does your taste influence the decisions? I don't, I, I don't think I've, I've done this experiment yet on myself. I'm usually following my own taste when I'm uh, producing or mixing, uh, barring, you know, what the, I know the client wants. Like it's the client's song. I'm not, Dan's not coming into this session uh, usually because, you know, I'm usually helping other people. 
And other than my own taste and following my own intuitions, it's usually about anything the artist might have primed me towards or against. Usually with like mixing, it's it's my own gut because the song kind of just tells you where it needs to go and you're and they're trusting your your taste and your ears to to bring it to fruition. And but yeah, like in production, it's like often it's like I'm following my gut, but I'm also like there with the artist and, you know, trying to help them create their vision. And so yeah, the artist is definitely high in the mind all the time. That makes sense? Yeah, no, yeah, totally. I think my experience with it, I think, is a bit different because of the styles of music that I work on. Because I do a lot of, you know, mostly pop and pop adjacent stuff. So a lot of times I'll have an artist that will will say something along the lines of, you know, I want to make sure that this song like feels like it fits on such and such playlist. Mm. Or, if, you know, it it's, stands up alongside x y and z artists right so to some degree it is the artist's vision and expectation and their like desire for where they want the song to be but that the way they describe it is based on an outside influence right i feel like in like the pop world there's just like a there's just more, more posing and more like uh there's like you're the, the, there's more of the comparison game you know what i mean yeah yeah it's 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 interesting and I feel like the more confident the artist is, the less of that there is. Right. As as there probably should be, right? That's not always the case, mm. obviously, but that's interesting. fairly indicative, you know? And I mean, at the same time, though, like that is just the reality of that style. Like if the, the, the purpose of making pop music is different from the purpose of making soul music, is different from the purpose of making deathcore. It's different from the purpose of making, you know, film scores, whatever it is. Like there's no right or wrong. Of course. It, you know, but that yeah. is, that is a, a, a genre specific, or at least like there, there are the, the nuances of those considerations are kind of specific to the audience. And I guess therefore the genre. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Especially like once you're like tr going for like top 40 style stuff and you really want to be charting and then you really need to like compare like, you know, luffs with, you know, with what's charting and you have to compare like, you know, kick drums to like popular kick drums, or, you know, all these things. You just have to get really into the weeds of what's popular right now. And there's a lot more referencing of current mixes. And that's, I totally get that. And, and I think it also depends on the, on the ultimate goal of the song and the ultimate goal of the artist's career, I guess. If you want to make a career as, or if the artist wants to make a career as a, you know, folk singer, then the listener's expectations of what that means is very different from somebody that wants to be a, you know, big pop artist or a, in a successful metal band. There are different expectations from those artists have to play for, you know, and make decisions based on. Right. Because they're showing their friends <laughs> the same way we yeah, show our and, friends. And not saying that every decision needs to be made with the purpose of doing exactly what that audience expects, right? There could be a lot of things where they're meeting some expectations in order to surprise them in other ways, but it's always a consideration. Yeah. I, I, I want to kind of shift the conversation a little bit, if that's okay, to receiving criti like criticism from clients, because I feel like that's kind of like what I thought we were going to talk about, even though this has been a great, like, kind of different way of doing criticism. I want to know, Carl, was there a time in your career that an artist was really critical of, of work you did that kind of changed your perception about something? And like, it was like a, it was like a seismic shift in, in how you perceive, you know, client relationships and, and just receiving criticism from your clients in general. One that sticks out to me, I forget the artist's name. I mean, I wouldn't have said it in the podcast anyway, but I genuinely can't remember what the name was. I was hired to do a mix. I was recommended by someone that I work with kind of regularly and they sent me the mix. They sent me the references and it was all like right up my alley. Like it was like early kid Cudi kind of like hip hop pop influence like that for all production kind of vibe where it's like it mm -hmm. definitely rooted in hip hop, but also the, the, the pop influence was very strong. And I was like, this is exactly, I, I know exactly where this wants to go. Like based on everything I'm, I'm hearing, this is exactly what I, 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 I know where this is going to go. You follow the music. Follow the music. It was one of the most proud mixes I've ever done. I sent it to him and 
the list of revisions was three pages long. And I would say, I don't want to say that all of them I disagreed with, but I would say conservatively, probably 80% of the notes I thought were actively going to make the song worse. And I started going through them, tried doing a few and what, what the artist wanted just felt like, Oh no, like this is not, this is so I'm so far off the page. I just responded and said, Hey, I don't think I'm the right person for this. I feel like I don't agree with these notes. I'm just going to send you your deposit back because I feel like you should find, you know, find somebody else that I think is sufficient because what I thought you wanted is very different than what you're telling me now. And I, I just was like, I'll, I'll take responsibility for it. Here's your money. Like, I don't, yeah. I'm not going to be a, a jerk and fight about That's it. That's the, upstand the upstanding method. <laughs> all, but also, it, like, it, it wasn't something where he gave a bunch of notes. They were right. They were just a lot of notes. Like, when so many of them I thought were actively making the song, like, getting in the way of what I thought was an incredible song. And I I, I just had to to do that. That, that was, I think, the seismic event of that wasn't like a negative feeling but it made me realize that i need to dig even deeper and making sure that i really understand what the vision is and that was that was a moment that kind of sparked me to consistently ask more and more and more and more questions uh for every potential client like i ask a ridiculous amount of questions and i you know what i have no regrets <laughs> about about that because it it is so worth it in the long run rather than just salivating because a client wants to work with me like of course i'm just going to say yes and make it work like that that those days are 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 long gone but that was a, that was a big shift for me and it wasn't a matter of getting you know hurt by the criticism it was more of a realization that my understanding of what the expectations were and what the goal was was so far off and yeah. i have one to blame but myself that's crazy i feel like that's like totally a really great takeaway from that uh, interaction. I'm curious why you didn't ask this client like for that information after that mix, as opposed to say, forget these, these notes, you know, like I think I missed the ball, you know, on what you're actually going for. Maybe let's talk about like what you're actually going for. And maybe I could reapproach it. If I remember correctly, I did like, I tried to like have that conversation, but it just seems like if I remember correctly to Actually, no, you know, no, 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 no. It's all coming back. That this is therapy right here. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I forgot about this. So, no, no. So the, the thing that made me go that route was that it was also very, I don't want to say ag aggressive isn't the right word, but like, yeah, it wasn't presented in a, in a positive light. Like, Hey, like here, you know, here's a, a bunch of things that I think could make this that are going to get it closer to my vision. It was like, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is bad. Like, it was just like the way it was presented that. I also didn't want to just deal with that kind of a person. Understood. I think yeah. that was, that was, I, I kind of forgot. Maybe I just, you know, repressed that into the back <laughs> of my brain. But yeah, I think that, I think that was why I was just like, nope, here's your money. And, and that it took a long time for me to be able to, to take the high road. I can't remember any at the moment that I, of times where I didn't take the high road, but I'm sure there were countless times <laughs> where I just got upset and offended and either, I don't think I ever really responded back negatively. I, my tendency is more so like self-loathing and just thinking that I'm shit yeah. at thing <laughs> or whatever, and thinking that like it's like, all my fault and that I'm hopeless and of I course. should I should quit. You know, that's that's more my instinct than to get up in arms and get get pissy with with them. Same, by the way. Yeah. You don't you don't strike me as the <laughs> get angry type. Yeah, well, I, I, I think I, I kind of learned a lot of these lessons, and this is coming to something I was thinking to talk about when we started this podcast episode, was, was I learned a lot of these lessons in a band, you know what I mean? Like with other musicians and and taking tough criticism from bandmates, like not even necessarily in the studio, like just like how I'm playing or or business decisions from the band and stuff like that. And just like, you know, being put in my place a couple of times, you know, really caused me to kind of, realize that it's not it's not like a personal offense it's just like trying to make the whole thing better and that slowly growing thick skin because of those interactions and and, the, and that thing and th now it doesn't mean that you you want to build up such thick skin that you 
become you know lifeless and don't uh, don't have feelings. But I think when you start to receive criticism, like you're playing too, you're being too busy, or you just have to work on your rhythm a little bit more, like you got to tighten up, whatever whatever it is that the criticism might have been. When you get enough of that stuff and you internalize, like, hey, we're just trying to make everything better. This is like a team project, and you're an integral part of that project, and you improving improves everybody. Over time, you kind of like learn that, hey, this is for everyone's own own good, and it's not a personal affront, you know? And so like getting reps of receiving criticism and building up that thick skin has like enabled me to kind of like in the studio almost always just be like, okay, like how can we get to your vision faster? I, I like being open to criticism, being open, open to mix revisions. That's been like a big part of how we work. It's just like, great, mix revisions are great. We're going to make your song better, you know? I've maybe taken the low road or felt like taking the low road a couple times, but it usually wasn't because of like criticism of how I was working. It was usually because of other extraneous issues. <laughs> yeah, I think the best part about having management is not the management part. It's that if I want to complain and just be a grumpy asshole, I can just call David yeah. and be like, oh, you know, and I can I can take the low road with him. Right. I love that. <laughs> He's like, uh, you know, he, and he can, I can commiserate and he can be like, okay. And then I'll be able to like, I get it all out of my system and then we can respond in a, yeah. In a and high it, road fashion. That's also something that friends can be for right there for you. Right. Like a, you can like bitch to your friends, right? Like get a beer with your best friend and like complain about your, your stupid clients, but don't, but don't bitch to your clients. Yeah. I, it, it was funny you say that because right before we got on this call, my good friend, and I believe friend of the show, also Lucas Gino. Um, hey, he and yes, I for sure. And like right before we we were going to get off the phone, he was like, "Oh, you know, before we go, anything you want to bitch about? Like any any uh, anything any anything you want to get off your chest? You need to commiserate about? Like I'm I'm all I'm all ears, <laughs> you know. So like you're right. Like having friends that also get it and know that when you say it, it's just venting steam, not how you actually actually feel. And so I'd say at this at this point in our lives, we're pretty good at at receiving criticism, I guess overall, right? <laughs> I guess being married has a has a hand in that. Well. But um, ching, <laughs> marriage joke. No, um, in, in all seriousness, though, I think like you know, getting older, having more experience, having more people in your life that are that feel comfortable giving you criticism, <laughs> you know, I think that <laughs> that does that does help. Whether um, it's your wife or anyone else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think we, uh, we started this, this conversation. You said something about putting in the, like, about like just experience with it. And I think that's really, that's really it. You're going to have to, if you're going to be a professional, you have to become comfortable with receiving criticism. Not everyone's going to like everything you do. And that doesn't, it's not a personal affront. It's just specific to that artist slash client's work. And you're there to facilitate that and like get over it internalize it and make better work because of that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't know. It's in summary. <laughs> yeah, no, I fully agree. I fully agree. It's, it comes down to a question of, are these criticisms a reflection of me as a person or just in technical choices or creative choices that I've made, right? And when you look at it that way and you can separate that, that enables you to build, uh, to build those calluses. Because if you think that it's a reflection on me as a person, that's a dangerous way to be. Yeah. But when you look at it as, oh, this is just a, a criticism of the choice that I made, the decision that I made, then you can separate it from your your being, from your your person, and learn from it. Yeah. I, I think also because a lot of us who are in audio come from a musical background, I think music often gets tied up with self-identification. And then when someone criticizes like, work in music that we did, we just immediately say like, oh, I am shit. You know, it becomes personalized so quickly. And then you just need to like do enough work to realize that it's not. <laughs> yeah. It's it's like the music will always be an expression of you, but it's an expression of that moment. It's not an expression of the totality of you. Right. And I think that's a really important Love thing that. to come to terms with. Right. Music is so transitory anyways, right? It's like a, it's a time-based art form. So amazing. Uh, any, any closing words before we wrap this episode? This is great. I think your podcasting skills are shit. 
<laughs> if they were so shit, then why did you join me on this show? <laughs> to fix you, Ben. I'm here to I'm here to fix you. Carl the fixer. <laughs> All right. Love it. No, no, no. Um, no, I I I I'm just I'll close the episode by just saying I'm so so happy to have these conversations. This is so much fun, and I'm still so thankful that you want to be to be a part of this in the first place. Aw. I'm I'm so glad that you decided to to join me on this venture. It's been fun. And it will continue to be fun, right? It it better, or it, I'm out. It had better. Yeah, or I'm out also. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Ben. Bye, Carl. We hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as we did. If anything here resonated with you, please share this or your favorite episode with a friend. And as always, we love to hear from our listeners. So find us on social media at Secret Sonics, at Ben Wallach Music, and at Carl Bonner. Until next time, bye, Ben. Bye, Carl. (laughs) That was good. I think the outro was great.